Good morning. The project was due on the 27th of March, but it's now due on the 4th of April. And I'm kind of forced to do that only because it's not an encouragement for you to put it off. The, the, the reason is I'm losing, I've lost a snow day already, I've lost, I'm losing Kipling on Friday and I'm losing Easter Friday. So this is the first time I've ever had three classes cut out of my course. Unfortunately, that means I have to cut out three classes of the making variable methods at the end. It also means, unfortunately, you won't have seen all the material you need by the time you need to do the project. So that's kind of forcing my hand to put that project so late. Um, which I didn't want to do, and I know that you've got other deadlines. So bear that in mind. It gives you an extra week for sure, but um, you've likely got other things going on at the same time. So let's just go back to where we were last class. What I'm going to do in today's class is, by the end of, end of today, you'll be able to analyze your complete set of experimental data. Okay, so pretty powerful what we're going to cover in today's class, but we're going to cover all the work you need to do in your course project. For those of you that are using a full factorial, many of you are recommending that you look at a fractional factorial, and so the work of the fractional factorials will come next to you. But everything in today's class is what you need for pretty much most of your experimental design. So let's take a look at it in terms of this example we had last time. We said we were going to go back to the system which has low interaction. And remember, we ran these experiments at low temperature, high temperature, so 338 and 354 Kelvin. And we had low concentration of S, the substrate 1 to 1.725 and 1.75. So what we can do is when we fill out our data table, this is the log table that you put in your report when you fill out your experiments. So you have a setting here for temperature. We run that at low, high, low, high. So this is going to become second hand to you. Minus plus, minus plus. The first factor, it alternates with the fastest rate in standard order. The second factor is substrate concentration. It alternates at the next fastest rate, which is minus, minus, plus, plus. So you fill out the table that way. Then we take simply the product of temperature and substrate because we want to estimate the temperature substrate interaction term. So minus times minus gives me plus. Plus times minus is a minus. Minus times plus is minus. Plus, plus, plus. And then I record also the column of y, which is the, the corresponding rule. So 69, 60, 64, and 53. The reason why I'm writing it up in this form is I want to show you now how we create the X matrix, which is where we ended off last class. We said we're going to estimate this least squares model, Y, with this intercept term, V0, a uh, slope coefficient for temperature, Vt, slope coefficient for substrate, Vs, and a slope coefficient temperature substrate interaction. Four estimates, four parameters that we need to estimate. We only have four data points, so we're going to have in this case, n, when we look back at our least squares technology, n is the number of rows, the number of observations is equal to 4, k is the number of parameters, which is 4. And then we said last class, or in the, sorry, the least squares section, the degrees of freedom is n minus k. So in this case, we've got no degrees of freedom. We're not able to estimate any confidence intervals. And I'll show you what happens when you put this in R um, today. So we'll get there in a minute. But we need to set up the X matrix. If we were doing this by hand, we would set up the X matrix as shown yesterday we derived. But we simply take my four observations, stack them on top of each other, and create an X matrix and create a Y vector. So I wanted to just quickly point out how trivial that X matrix is to construct. It's simply a copy paste of your data table. So your X matrix, just to help us write X times B. So I'm going to take my X matrix multiplied by the B vector. I'm going to fill in my X matrix and my B vector is my intercept B0, BT. I simply take my columns in order BS and BTS. So my x columns must correspond to these four slope coefficients. 
the first column is always a column of, of ones. This is for your intercept. So I sometimes add this to my data table just so that I, I keep track of it. So plus, 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 plus. Simply just add an intercept column, emphasizing we've got a column of one, 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 one. Right, plus two. So that's a, co a column that corresponds to my intercept. Then I have the column corresponding to the temperature effect. Simply copy and paste out that temperature effect column. So it's minus one, plus one, minus one, plus one. Next column is the S effect. The term due to the substrate concentration is minus one, minus one, plus one, plus one. And then the final column is the temperature substrate interaction. Again, just copy and paste out this column from the table. Plus one, minus one, minus one, minus one. So X matrix, provided you write your, your table in standard order, is really trivial to set up. Your Y vector, again, is really trivial. It's just copy and paste of your results that you measure at your output. So 60, 64. <coughs> Then you can go ahead and put that into R, or MATLAB even, if you prefer. So I put the code both for MATLAB and R on the course website. And you can say B is equal to X transpose X inverse X transpose Y. And you will get those four estimates of the parameters in matrix form. Now, you will find that if you calculate that X matrix, so this is my X matrix over here, you put that into MATLAB or R, that this X matrix, when you say X transpose X, you'll get a matrix that's shown up here on the slide. You'll get fours on the diagonal and zeros on the both diagonal. So X transpose X, we have looked at this matrix earlier, and of course we said that this is a variance covariance matrix. You recall the elements on the diagonal are the variances of the respective columns. So the first entry there is the variance of this intercept column. The second entry, two, the two two entry is the variance of this second column, and so forth. Interestingly, that the covariance elements, which are the off diagonals, they're all zeros, indicating that there's no covariance between any of the columns in X. Or another way of saying it, there's no correlation between the columns of X. There's no covariance, by definition there's no correlation either. So we say then that the temperature column is uncorrelated to the substrate column. And it's also uncorrelated to the interaction term. Very, very powerful statement because it simplifies matters tremendously for us. The reason why I say that is because when we come back to interpret this model later on, I can interpret, so here's my model, the first row. Earlier in the least squares section, I, if I had to interpret this Vt coefficient, that slope coefficient for temperature, my interpretation would have been as follows. That's the effect of changing temperature by one unit, keeping all other variables constant. The fact that x transpose x has zeros on the off diagonal means I don't need to say that keep all other variables constant anymore. Because none of these other factors interact with each other. All of these factors are independent. So this is the pure effect of temperature alone. That's the pure effect of substrate alone. And that's the pure temperature substrate interaction alone. We don't have to qualify our interpretations by saying keep all other things constant. We're guaranteed that that's the effect of temperature substrate and the temperature substrate interaction. So that's really, really powerful. The other really convenient outcome of the fact that X transpose X has only got non-zeros on the diagonal and zeros everywhere on the off diagonals means we can trivially invert this matrix. So to invert it then, you simply take the columns, sorry, those, those diagonal entries and you invert them, one over, one over four, one over four. So X transpose X inverse is easy to calculate. Let's take a look at X transpose Y. I could write out this matrix X here, transpose it, and then multiply it by Y. 
and guaranteed I will see at least 10 to 20% of you do that in the final exam and waste about 10 minutes doing it. There's a far easier way of calculating x transpose y. And you can prove to yourself that it's the correct answer. Simply take these columns and one by one multiply them with y and accumulate as you go. So let's take a look. X transpose y for the first entry, so add a row here, x transpose y, is 69 plus 60 plus 64 plus 53. So I'll write it up long ways. So this first entry is 69 plus 60 plus 64 plus 53 is equal to 21246. There is no need to actually write this x matrix out, transpose it, multiply it by y, element by element. You can prove to yourself that that's exactly what it's doing. If I transpose this x matrix, it says 69 plus 60 plus 64 plus 53. So it's, this is why I like the standard table, because now we simply just go down and multiply. Let's, uh, let's calculate the second entry in x transpose y. It says, take this temperature column, so minus 69 plus 60 minus 64 plus 53, and that will get you minus 20. X transpose y for the third entry is this s column multiplied by y, so this is now negative 69 minus 60 plus 64 plus 53, and that will get you minus 12. And then the final entry in x transpose y is plus 69 minus 60 minus 64 plus 53, and that gets you minus 2. So x transpose y is the covariance of the columns of x with y. It's how much these individual columns move up and down or co-vary with y. So the fact that I'm getting a fairly large negative here, minus 20, means that as temperature goes up, substrate goes down. I'm sorry, as temperature goes up, <coughs> the yield y goes down. They're negatively correlated. We never actually interpret this intercept term. Okay, so this 246, the term x transpose y with the intercept, is never interpreted. So we don't ever interpret that first entry, but all the subsequent entries we can. It's showing here that as temperature goes up, yield goes down. Let's go look back at our raw data. So as temperature goes up, so from the low level of temperature to high level of temperature, yield goes down. As temperature goes up from low to high, yield goes down, 64 to 53. So there's a negative correlation. So x transpose x, easy to calculate, x transpose y, easy to calculate, x transpose x inverse then multiply by x transpose y gives <coughs> your b vector right away. Okay, and there's my, there's my least squares model. So here y is equal to 61 and a half for the intercept term, a minus 5 slope for temperature, a minus 3 slope for substrate, and then a small interaction because we know the system has little interaction. Everyone comfortable with that calculation? Okay, this is something for, for simple systems that you must be able to do by hand, especially for testing exams, but also, uh, as I said last class, you're going to be in the, in the plant working while you're running these experiments. It's really helpful that you can get an interpretation of your model right away, because that may even guide you to where you run your next experiment, so you don't have to go back to your computer, figure stuff out, and then come back in again. So very often, especially when you're running experiments under a tight time frame, it's really helpful to be able to do these calculations on a small piece of paper. Let's take a look, yes. So um, the signs that we got for the like, correlation that we got from the x, y, yeah. that'll always match the b, I think? Sorry? Yeah, that will always match the b, I think. That's right, because your x transpose x matrix will always be positive entries, so x, t, y signs hold out and propagate out to the b vector. Good, good observation. Let's take a look at uh, doing this in R then. 
this code is posted online, so you I don't need to copy down what I put is up here. So in R, so there you create your temperature vector T minus plus minus plus. You create your substrate vector minus minus plus plus. You create your yield vector Y with the four entries. So everything is done in standard order here. Now you want to tell R to build you a linear model, which has an intercept term for P0. R will automatically add that for you. You don't need to specify that. You want a temperature effect, a substrate effect, and then the temperature substrate interaction. So you simply use T times S. Let's take a look at what you get from that. So paste that all in and run that. So here's the output, exactly the four coefficients we had up earlier in the slide. So here's my intercept term. The temperature effect is minus 5, substrate effect is minus 3, and then R uses this notation colons for the interaction. So the Ts, or the temperature substrate interaction, is small, minus 0.5. We have no residual degrees of freedom. R tells us that over here. All four residuals are zero, no residual degrees of freedom, so it cannot estimate standard errors T values and, and those P values. Also, there's no standard error value here, it's NAN, zero degrees of freedom, your R squared is one, fits the data perfectly. So everything that we expect to see is shown up here. And the key is very trivial to validate what you've calculated by hand. This is how you're going to do it in software for four or five factors. So many of you are doing experiments with around four factors. You will never calculate how many factors. If you've got four factors, you've got 16 parameters. You've got two to the four to slope coefficients. You're not going to calculate a 16 by 16 uh, x transpose x matrix or 16 by 1 x transpose y. Let the computer do it for you in this manner that I've shown you here. Okay, and I'll, I'll look at an example next where we go to a three factor system. So we're going to build this up in today's class. Now, let's take a look at that. That's one thing to get the model. It's another thing to interpret it. So let's take a little bit of time interpreting the model. I'll do one example. The temperature effect for Bt, so we have y is equal to B0 plus Bt xt plus the other terms. So Bt here was estimated as minus 5. Our xt variable, remember this was either minus 1 or plus 1 entries. That minus 1 corresponded to a temperature of 338 Kelvin. And the plus 1 corresponded to a temperature of 354 Kelvin. So remember our first step earlier was, in uh, last class, we, we normalized this data. So we, so we calculated essentially deviation variables. I subtracted this low level of temperature from the base case. And I subtracted the high temperature from the base case, and I divided through by half the range. So that maps minus 338 onto minus 1, and it maps the high level 354 to plus 1. The baseline, which is the midpoint between the two, gets mapped to 0. Okay, so that's what xt corresponds to. xt is not your raw temperature. You don't plug in 338 and 354. You plug in simply minus ones and plus ones in xt. And that's what's used by R to build the model. So R does not see your raw data. That's the key point. So R only sees your coded variables between minus one and plus one. So when we interpret this minus five here, it says it's the change in yield we expect to see when xt changes by one normalized unit. That's important because we're going to expect to see a 5% decrease in yield. So my yields are uh, measured in percent. That's the units over here. So I expect to see a 5% decrease in yield for a one unit change in the normalized temperature in this XT here. 
Well, the one unit change corresponds, you can visual, understand it in two ways. It's either a change from 0 to 1, or it's a change from minus 1 to 0. Those would be two ways of interpreting. You can also choose any two points that are one unit apart. But these are the two most natural ones. So that's coded units, but we need to always tell our operators, and when we're talking about these results to our colleagues, we can't talk in coded units. They don't understand that. So let's map our coded units back to reality. Well, that's easy. A change from 0 to 1 implies a change from my baseline, 346, up to 354. That's an 8 degree increase, or an 8 Kelvin increase. So if we wanted to map back into real world units, we'd say every 8 Kelvin increase in temperature will correspond to a decreasing yield on average of 5%. That's our interpretation. We could also equally well interpret it as going from the low level to the baseline. So either one of those, it still corresponds to an 8 Kelvin increase will map to a 5% decrease in yield. Okay. So the substrate concentration, that had a slope coefficient of minus 3. Substrate was measured in grams per liter. You can go home and, and, and logically extend that interpretation to the BS coefficient. Now, the other thing to, to talk about is how would you use this model in the future? That's the important part, right? We have this model that we built and we visualized it last time as this plane that spans the range from minus 1, minus 1 in this corner up to plus, plus 1 in this corner. This model is valid at points outside and inside that range. Okay, so I can legitimately use the model at a point here, say, at 0.5.5 over here. I can also use this model outside the range. Clearly not far away, but within a local region of this area, this model definitely applies. So for example, this model's encoded units corresponds to a range in temperature from 338 at the low level up to 354 at the high. It would be no problem to use this model down at about 330 Kelvin, maybe 332 Kelvin. Now I could probably go as far up as 360, 365. It's not clear, I mean, there's no guarantee, but I certainly could go use the model outside that range. So let's take a look then. Let's say I wanted to use this model at, let's take for example, T equals 330 Kelvin, and I wanted to use it at S equals uh, 1.5 grams per liter. What would be my, what would be my prediction of Y? So take a minute or two and figure that out.
330 minus the baseline, the center point in this case, which is 346, divided by half the range, which was 8. Okay, so that corresponds to minus 16 <coughs> over 8 is minus 2. Excess is 1.5 grams per liter. And the baseline in this case was 1.5, so divided by half the range, which was 0.5 over 2, it's still 0. So I substitute those in. So my intercept minus the slope coefficient for temperature times minus 2 plus the slope coefficient for substrate multiplied by 0, and here minus 2 times 0. So it's 61.5 plus 10. So I get an estimate of 72 and a half as my yield at that point. Okay, so key key point here in this example is to map your your coded units back to real world units and vice versa. You need to be very comfortable moving between the two between the two systems. And this is your linking equation that, that does the mapping for you. So your raw data minus the center point divided by half the range. Okay, and the nice thing is that that implementation, the minus five slope coefficient for temperature and the minus three slope coefficient for substrate, they agree with what we got here. When we did this very first analysis, I asked you to report half the average, and that's that minus three over here, that's the minus five. And that was the reason for that hardening strategy over there. I'd like you to go home and try the following with the high interaction system. You have the data there in your slides, you have the baseline for the temperature and substrate. Go ahead and construct the X transpose X inverse matrix, the X transpose Y, and prove to yourself that you get that model. Okay, so you must be able to do that in, um, in the test and exam situation as well. What's interesting here is for this interpretation is the X transpose, uh, sorry, the, the temperature substrate interaction has a coefficient of one and a half, which is pretty high when we compare it to all the other coefficients. So we, one thing, unfortunately, we cannot do is estimate confidence intervals for these coefficients. So one of the strategies we resort to is we simply look for coefficients which are high numerically. And as long as they're high numerically, we say that those terms are significant. This is not something you can do on a normal least squares model. The only reason why we can do it on these models is firstly, we've coded all our x variables to be on the range from minus one to plus one. So that allows us to compare coefficients. Normally we don't go code our variables like that. Normally we use the raw data in these squares models. So then we cannot compare slope coefficients. But here, because I've coded my variables to lie between minus one and plus one, it's absolutely fair to make comparisons between the two or between multiple coefficients. The other reason why we, we can compare coefficients is the fact that I know each column is independent of the other. There's no interaction or, or correlation between one x and another x. So each slope coefficient, that's the pure effect of temperature. There's no confounding in there. So I'm introducing a few terms we're going to talk about in the, in the next class. Confounding is one of them. We're going to see confounding coming up in our models. But the fact that I've got pure independence here means I've got no confounding. That's the pure effect of temperature, the pure effect of substrate. And so it's legitimate to compare those, those coefficients there. Okay. Uh, what is the interaction coefficient over here? The 1.5? Okay. Let's take a look at that. Actually, it's a, I was going to illustrate it visually, but then we can also come back to it algebraically. Here I've illustrated that high interaction term. If I plot that least squares model, I have y is equal to b0 plus btx to bsx, but I also have this term over here, the interaction term. If I go set this term to 0, 
I have a regular multiple linear regression model that you've seen before. And that's what its surface looks like. It's a linear plane going from the low point to the high point in this instance. And I've ignored the effect of interaction. If I add the interaction back, notice what happens here. These two corner points on the left and the right, they curl down slightly and they move to a lower value. And it's, it bends that curve to map the ridge. So remember, this was the system that was on the ridge. So it then adds curvature to that plane to account for the interaction. Some people have a problem seeing this geometrically. That's fine. Let's take a look at it algebraically. It's, it's easy to interpret algebraically as well. Let's say my aim is to maximize yield. I want to get as high a y value as possible. This model is telling me, ignore the interaction for now, <coughs> if I want to increase y, I should increase the temperature. It's got a positive coefficient. So a, positive, a temperature that's above the baseline, xt will then be greater than 1, or greater than 0. So as long as temperature is above the baseline, I will get a positive contribution to boost my yield. If my substrate coefficient, substrate concentration I should say, is above the baseline value, that term is also going to be positive and it's going to boost the yield by three and a half units for every one unit coded. But here's another interesting contribution. If Xt is positive and Xs are both positive, I'm going to get an additional benefit from this interaction term. I'm going to increase my xt because that's positive multiplied by a positive. I'm going to get an additional contribution from that last term. So those, the temperature interacts with the substrate to even further improve the yield. If the interaction term was zero, you'd get none of that additional coming. So all the interaction is, how much do these two variables play or interact with each other to either increase or decrease your flow. So these, in this example, the temperature and the substrate work synergistically for us because increasing temperature boosts my yield, increasing substrate boosts my yield, and both together boosts my yield. But if this was a negative, yeah, so this was maybe minus three, then I've got a problem. Because then I, this tells me to increase temperature, increase substrate, but it's going to then disappear out here. So sometimes we get our interactions working with us, sometimes our interactions work against us. That's why they're important to estimate. Okay, let's take a look then at this three-factor example. This is a this is an important example because a good number of you are suggesting experiments in three factors and some of you in four factors. So four-factor experiments we cannot visualize. This one we can still visualize, and it's really interesting to see how far you can go just with a simple diagram. So this system is from a plastics company, and their aim is to minimize the pollutant that they discharge. So in this, this is the opposite of what we normally do. Normally we want to maximize our, our response variable. In this case, my response y is not a yield, my response is actually pollutant, the amount of pollutant, and I want to minimize this. So there's three factors that this company investigated. This is actual data from ICI Chemical in the UK. They investigated adding a chemical compound, A versus B, some form of catalyst if you want to see it that way, that they add to their water system. The treatment temperature, low temperature, high temperature, and then the stirring speed, low speed and high speed. This example also introduces the, an exa uh, a situation of where one of our factors is a binary variable. So the previous examples have only considered continuous variables. Let's take a look at what happens if one of my factors, C in this case, is a binary variable, which again corresponds to many of the experiments some of you suggested. For those types of variables, categorical variables or binary variables, simply assign arbitrarily one of the levels to minus one and assign arbitrarily the other level to plus one. And you, it doesn't matter which way around you do it, your results will still be consistent. So in this case, I, it's more, more natural and we commonly see this as A is minus one, B is plus one. So let's take a look at what happens then. We draw a cube. So this is a, 
This is a, a great visualization of the data. So draw a cube of the system. And because we've got three factors, it's a three-dimensional data. So this first factor on the horizontal axis will I'll be the effect of, of my chemical compound, and it maps to A at the lower level and B at the high level. The next axis will be for temperature temperature effect, and this maps to 72 Fahrenheit at the lower level, and 100 at the high level. And then the final factor going in and out of the board is this S variable, the stirring speed was either run at low RPMs or at high RPMs. So that's this direction going in and out of the page. The key way to write this or to visualize this table is to let's map our vertices directly to the Y. So the polluted discharge. And let's take a look here how we do this. On the board, if you've written your table in standard order, it's trivial to transcribe this picture out of this table to a picture. Simply go to the corners, there's five. Here's thirty. Bottom left, bottom right. Top left, 6. Top right, 33. Then repeat for the back face. 4, 3, on the right, top, 5, and 4. Okay, so if you do, provided you do it in standard order, this becomes trivial to, to do. And now it's easy. Where should the company operate their process to get the, the least amount of pollutant discharged? Under which conditions? So if we want to minimize the pollutant discharged, so high speed. We're talking about general general directions here. Which general idea, which general direction should the company use to operate the process? And use whichever is cheaper. Sorry? Use whichever is cheaper. Use whichever is cheaper. Whichever is cheaper. Yeah. Okay, so it seems like use A or B. There's a bit of uncertainty here how to interpret the compound effect. I don't think there's uncertainty, but I, I can see why you yeah, why there's um, some doubt. Okay, so let's take a look then. Well, I'm not going to derive this one by hand. This is, as you can imagine, if I had to derive all the all the effects by hand, it's going to take a while. What I will do is we'll go to the software and we'll interpret the software's output because that's what you need to do for your course project. On the course website, however, is the derivation by hand for estimating the C effect, the T effect, and the S effect. Okay. Let me maybe just do one of them. I'll do the C effect. 
how many estimates of C, the chemical compound effect, do we have? So when we had the two-factor case, we had two estimates of every main effect. How many estimates do I have of the main effect of, of C this time? Okay, I have four, four estimates of the C effect. I can see what the effect is of changing from compound A to B four times. I have a measurement here going from 5 to 30. I have it going from 6 to 33. I have it going from 5 to 4. And I have it from 4 to 3. These are why factorial designs are so great. They give us so much information. Four times I can estimate what that C factor is. So when you do this in the software, uh, sorry, if you do this by hand, the effect of C Remember, we always go from high to low, and then we take the average of it. So it's 33 minus 6, 30 minus 5. On the front face, on the back face, I have 4 minus 5, and 3 minus 4. Okay, so I have estimate there of 27, 25, minus 1, minus 1. So that's an average effect of 50 over 4, which corresponds to 12.5 units. Now this, this is important. So 12.5 units when changing from compound a to B. So on average, we will boost our pollutant level by 12 and a half units if we change from compound A to compound B. So now which compound should we be using? A. Okay, so we definitely need to be using A. Because on average the effect is 12 and a half unit increase when we when we go from A to B. But we report this as half that effect. Okay? This is where people get a little bit concerned with the software, is report this as 6.25. So in other words, BC in my model is going to be 6.25. And I get that from 12 and a half divided by 2. So the slope coefficient the slope coefficient for categorical variables, for binary variables, in your least squares models are going to be half the effect when changing from the rows condition of A to B. So the full change going from A to B is actually double that. So that we know, here yeah, I've calculated for you, the true effect of going from A to B is 12 and a half units. When R reports this to you, R is not, is not going to give you 12.5 units. R is going to report 6.25. So only for categorical variables do you double up that number. Uh, when you're choosing between like A or B, like, or like the optimum points are, were you choosing like the one point? Or like were you doing it by like each section? Because if you look at like to choose A or B, you have 5 and 4 for A and 33 for B. That's why you choose A. Is that the reason behind that? Because it's lower than the B side? Or? So this face over here on the left is, is more consistently lower. Yeah. Okay. Then this upper face where B gets you sometimes high and sometimes not. So is that the reason why you didn't choose yeah. A? So these are, when we're trying to find, when we're using these models, remember I arbitrarily pick these locations of 72 Fahrenheit, 100 Fahrenheit, 200 and 400. We're saying, well, what is the general direction we need to move our process to to minimize pollutants? Well, the general direction is in this way in terms of A. In terms of substrate, it's that way, high speeds. And in terms of temperature, people were saying to use low temperature. Is that true? What is the temperature effect in this system? The temperature effect on average is pretty small, pretty minimal. The difference from 5 to 6, 30 to 33, 5 to 4, 20 to 4. Pretty small. So temperature may actually be insensitive in this example. 
you may have pretty much freedom to, to operate at any temperature. And so then the natural outcome is, well, let's pick the low temperature level because that's going to be less energy intensive for us. Okay, so here's an important point. When we do design experiments, sometimes we find some of our factors are not significant. That's equally important an outcome as finding that the factor is significant. Knowing a factor is not significant is a great result because it can tell you your process is insensitive to changes in this direction. And so we would then move our process to operate at the lower energy of the two. So whichever it costs less money to operate or whichever of the settings generate us the most profit. Okay, because it's telling me I can get more profit I'm going to obviously spend less money heating my, my material, and I'm still going to get the same amount of pollution discharged. Okay, so definitely um, pick the lower temperature of the two, but not because it has effect, but actually because it has no effect. Let's take a look at, at R then to, to do that work for us. So again, you've asked for lots of R examples. Here's, here's another one coming up. Now, as you can imagine, I typed in by hand what all the corner points were up here for the 2x2 two two system, and that's trivial and feasible. But the moment we get to a three-factor system of four or five factors, to set up those vectors is going to be error-prone. So R has some great built-in tools for us. So here's one, you've probably not seen a command like this, but R, R allows this sort of craziness. It says, assign a vector minus one plus one, and assign it to S, T, and C. So I'm creating three variables in one line. So I can go run that. So there's C, there's T, there's S. But they're just minus ones and plus ones. They're not quite what I need. So R has another function called expand.grid, which will create exactly your design for you. Okay, so if I look at what design is, it's that standard order column. So I don't have to go code this up myself and make mistakes with the minuses and pluses. It will do it all for me, which is what computers are for. Then we go take out C, T, and S, the, first, the three columns from that matrix. So there's C, there's T, there's S. I only, this is the only one I have to type in myself, it's Y. So there's my vector of Y's from the table that we had up earlier. Now I can go build my full factorial model. So build me a linear model Y, which is described by eight factors. So three factors at two levels gets me eight parameters. So Y described by C, T, and S, the C, T interaction, C, S interaction, and S, T interaction, and then a three factor C, T, S interaction. That's doable, but R has another command, as you can imagine, to make this even simpler for us. It will expand out that if I use, give me a model Y described by open brackets, C plus T plus S, raised to the power of three, and it will form all the interaction combinations for you, which is really nice if you're dealing with four or five factors, but you don't have to make mistakes multiplying out all the, all the combinations to keep track with the results of all. Okay, so let's, let's run that guy, mod.full, and we can now go and investigate. So this is telling me my intercept is at 11.25 units, the, concentra uh, the C effect, whether I should be using A or B, is 6.25. That's the value I derived out here. So the BC slope coefficient, that's the effect when changing C from low to higher, I need to double that. The temperature effect is 0.75. Relative to the compound effect, that's a small number, proving again that temperature is pretty insensitive in the system. This substrate, it says minus 7.25. Okay. So should I be using high substrate? Uh, sorry, not substrate, speed. High stirrer speed or low stirrer speed? High stirrer speed? I or low? I or low? Okay, let's think about our next class. So I want you to go and also interpret the CS interaction. That one's more interesting. 